Hey, listeners, welcome back to the Third Wave podcast. Again, I'm your host, Paul Austin, founder of the Third Wave and co-founder of Synthesis. And again, this week, we're bringing you another live podcast from one, one of our Third Wave Node events. This one, our inaugural event from San Francisco, entitled Transitioning from Business as Usual with Psychedelics, Navigating Life and Business After transformation. And really within this evening of discussion, we talked about life transitions and the role psychedelics play for integrating our personal lives with our professional ambition. And so within this, I interviewed a panel of business and entrepreneurial leaders, each having experienced significant psychedelic transformations mid-career, impacting both their personal and professional lives. Uh, The panel consisted of Michael Kosturis, who we've had on the podcast before, who is an executive coach who works with Ayahuasca, leads something called Entrepreneur's Awakening. Tiffany Liu, who's a former VP at LegalZoom and co-founder of two successful startups. And Tim Sekou, also a founder who bootstrapped his first company, Tint, into a successful exit. Uh, So we get deep into particularly Ayahuasca and what role Ayahuasca plays in really helping leaders to become more heart-centered. We talk about the pitfalls of ambition that come from a more ego-driven, achievement-oriented perspective and really what can be done uh, when looking forward at creating a healthy container to integrate psychedelics into our entrepreneurial and ultimately capitalist uh, culture and what role they could play, psychedelics will play for just business in general uh, when it comes to our culture at large. So this was a fascinating discussion. I had a really good time doing this first event in San Francisco. And I think you'll really enjoy this discussion. Now, if you want to further support us at The Third Wave, there are a few ways that you can do that. First of all, you can donate uh, by going to our website and, and clicking any button that, you says, uh, that, that says uh, donate so you can support us that way. Uh, we're also looking for private donors. So if that's something that you are interested in supporting us at a higher level, please get in touch. Finally, if you're interested in working with psychedelics in a legal format, uh, I co-founded a retreat center called Synthesis in Amsterdam. And by signing up for a retreat and mentioning that you found us through the third wave, um, you'll be able to support this podcast and all the educational work we're doing as a nonprofit at the third wave. So without further ado, I bring you our third wave note event from San Francisco, transitioning from business as usual with psychedelics. Let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. And the first panelist that I want to introduce is Michael Kosturis, but he's right up on the screen. Michael is an executive coach and uh, the founder of Entrepreneurs Awakening. He brings founders, CEOs down to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca as part of a larger uh, mastermind. And so tonight he will talk about the experiences that those individuals have had with ayahuasca, as well as something called spiral dynamics and how that's relevant to this waking up and growing up process. So if you all could give Michael a big round of applause. He's sick at home right now, but still is making it through Zoom. So thank you, Michael. Our second panelist tonight is Tim Sekou, who is uh, an exit co-founder of a bootstrapped startup that's based in San Francisco called Tint. I met Tim at this retreat a few months ago, and we've connected both on a personal and professional level. So Tim will join us to tell us about his journey and what transitions he's gone through recently as he's exited and is looking into what's next for him. So if you could give Tim a big round of applause. And our last panelist is Tiffany Liu. Tiffany is also a successful startup Uh, exit startup founder herself, but most recently has worked in the corporate world, uh, working for both HP, but also most recently was a VP slash GM of LegalZoom. She left her job about four months ago, and she will talk more from the corporate perspective in terms of what experience that she went through and how plant medicine has played a role in her own transition in terms of what's coming next as well. So if you give Tiffany a big round of applause. And Michael, I'd love to start with you. 
as we get into this discussion, if you could just briefly introduce yourself, uh, including what brought you to working with Ayahuasca, particularly with founders and CEOs. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So I was a startup founder. I founded my company more or less in 2005. And by 2008, it was going through the, like just the burnout, the intensity of having a tech startup in San Francisco. And kind of a long story, but I found myself invited to go to Peru to do a reset with, with ayahuasca. And it both seemed like the best idea ever and the worst idea ever. So I was really on the fence all the way up until the point where I actually got to the retreat center in Peru. I wasn't sure whether it was the right thing for me to do. But I ended up doing the retreat and it turned out to be the best thing ever. I came back to my company, like totally reset all my resentments and frustrations with toward the co-founders and certain business directions and et cetera were washed away. And I was able to fully engage with passion and enjoyment, but not have my ego attached to the outcome of the company anymore. So it really freed my ego. And in retrospect, I realized that I was operating in what I'll later describe as an orange meme in spiral dynamics, um, where my ego was attached to the company and the company's success and the logo was me and all this stuff. So I was able to, to leave the company in 2010 and started executive coaching. Because what I learned I just loved most about having a company was mentoring and developing people and teams. So I started doing that as an interim thing to do between companies, presumably. And I quickly discovered that all the best executive coaching tricks in the world could only do so much and took a lot longer than a weekend of, or a week of ayahuasca in, in Peru. So I started pitching my clients, the ones that were already burners and, you know, had tried the Kool-Aid in one form or another. I'm like, Hey, why don't we go and spend a week in Peru, go to Machu Picchu, have a total reset. I'll, and I'll do the prep and integration for you uh, around the ayahuasca retreat. And as they started saying yes, it became clear that I should be bringing groups down because there's so much more value in the shared experience. So uh, in 2011, I actually moved to Peru to spend five months there drinking with all the ayahuasca I could find to figure out what's the what. You know, there's as many types and ways to do ayahuasca as there is yoga. And as you may know, not every yoga is your cup of tea or the right medicine for what your body needs at that time in the same way with ayahuasca. So I drank with a lot of different shamans and found the right one for high functioning type A people who don't identify as sick, um, who are looking for a reset. And um, so 2012, I brought my first group down and I've been bringing down groups ever since. And the program I, I have is a three month program and includes you know, six weeks of preparation and then improve for two weeks and then six weeks of integration. And the results, as you can imagine, have been extraordinary. And so I'm, I'm working on scaling the programs that we're offering this year to be able to do three retreats in the Amazon this year. So that's a bit about the background and how I got where I'm at. This is where I would like to see your faces and know what you're interested in. So I'll just rely on you, Paul. Like, what do you want me to say next? <laughs> Well, thank you, Michael. We'll we'll get back to you. Um, okay, Tim. Let's let's move to you and talk a little bit about your own journey and just uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you into Tint as a a co-founder for a bootstrap company and where did you find yourself? You know, a couple months ago with with a successful exit. Yeah. Uh, so, hello, everybody. My name is Tim, and um, you know, I just wanted to preface by saying, like, my intention today sharing here is just to be vulnerable and share my story. I'm not an expert in all of this. I've gone through it uh, from a, from a let's say, startup business experience, um, exploring with psychedelics in a safe way. And I'm just here to share that story and connect with people who may be on that path or interested in learning more about that path. But as Paul mentioned, I started a company about seven years ago as an accidental project from my college course in entrepreneurship back in uh, my undergraduate degree and uh, decided to start running with it ever, uh, ever since, after graduation. Um, and like Michael mentioned, um, as I progressed through my journey, I attached my identity and ego to the success of the company. And as many have experienced, it's a freaking roller coaster. And so when times go up, I'm just so present and happy but inevitably it'll fall down and I was like locked, I locked myself away or I just ignore people and, and um, fell into a state of like just 
anger or, or sadness. And as one big momentous situation happened where we hit our first layoff situation, I was like really, really angry and sad and just fell into a spiral. And I couldn't really get out of it. And I remember one person said to just meditate. Just meditate for five minutes a day. The only rule is you don't stop. And uh, it might take you six months to realize why it'll be beneficial, uh, but just keep doing it. And that was back in 2016, and I've stopped a few days, but been going ever since. As I've been doing that, I've been being more aware of my own emotions and my own self, then broke into this curiosity of like learning more about what other modalities are out there that can bring more awareness to who I am, and that's when psychedelics came into play. Uh, so I've started psychedelics um, in 2014, but more of a, let's say, concert, Coachella setting, like fun, fun, fun. Um, and that's great and all, but after each session, I was like, okay, that's it. Like, okay, that's fine. Um, until I was exposed to more intentional practices. And so I ventured off into the woods many times by myself or with peers and would have these uh, safer uh, experiences in nature to reflect on issues or things and questions I had for myself. And that's when I was really like exploring just so much more, understanding more of myself, that then I explored um, ayahuasca about a year ago. And it was through these experiences uh, multiple times in this past year that woke me up to what was my values and my alignment to how I would spend my time that ultimately motivated me and pushed me to exit the company so that I could spend time on more aligned um, opportunities in the future, which right now I'm exploring um, safe psychedelic experiences for other entrepreneurs who may be feeling blocked or stuck in what they're doing because I can empathize with them and provide these safer experiences in legalized areas to work with them and sit with them and uh, ideate with them on what it is that's more aligned with them, just purely from personal experience. Great, thanks, Tim. And let's move to you, Tiffany. Could you tell us, could you tell us a little bit about your background in terms of the startup world and then moving into HP and LegalZoom and, and where you found yourself a few months ago when you, when you quit from, from LegalZoom? If only my mother can see me now. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I should say first, um, just a little background. I'm like the one San Franciscan that isn't a burner. Um, super straight lace, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I prefer, you know, wine and cheese versus like being in the woods, communing with nature. So for me to be here is, is really funny to me. <laughs> So how this all started um, was because um, about, I want to say, almost a year ago, you know, I was at the height of my career. Um, it was everything that I dreamed of. You know, I was, you know, building this incredible team. You know, I had a wonderful boss, the, the sponsorship of the board. You know, we just got the next round of funding. I was doing this inspiring do good mission. You know, I had an apartment in Austin, a house here in San Francisco. And I can't begin to explain to myself why even at that height um, of what everything that I wanted in my career, I was also at that time the loneliest and the emptiest I've ever felt in my life. I couldn't explain it. I didn't understand why. We were, I was working for a pre-IPO company with a big equity stake. I mean, it was everything that everyone dreams of, right? Get into the right company at the right time and go IPO, quit. I was in all those positions, and yet I felt so lonely. It didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, and the only thing that kind of sort of got me going in terms of you know, going through the grind was to be of service to my team. That was the only reason I said, if I'm going to leave, I have to leave it in a very successful place. I ended up uh, making the one decision, thank God, that saved me was I said that, you know, I have to quit because I wasn't happy and I had to follow that feeling and I knew staying in it wasn't the right decision. And so I ended up quitting um, to the demise of a lot of my friends and family members who were thinking like, are you crazy? And um, shortly after, I was talking to actually Tim's sister, <laughs> who is also an executive down in um, LA. And she told me, hush, hush, she said, hey, I have to tell you about this thing that I went to a year ago. 
totally changed my life. And I was so thirsty. I was just craving for something, for answers. And so that began my journey. And we're going to get a little bit deeper into both of those journeys. But before we do that, Michael, I'd love, you know, we're hearing similar stories, both from you, from Tim, uh, from Tiffany. I think this is pretty common generally with, with entrepreneurs, type A, ambitious uh, people. And I'd love if you could just explain a little bit uh, about the concept of, of spiral dynamics. Uh, spiral dynamics is a concept that was popularized by Ken Wilber uh, in talking about this waking up and growing up process and specifically um, how spiral dynamics with psychedelics as a tool can be applied to these stories that we're seeing happening more and more in places like San Francisco, LA, and New York in, in the tech startup and, and corporate scene. Yeah, it's actually a great tool to sort of make sense out of this. So if anyone is not familiar with spiral dynamics, the easiest way to do this after the show would be to do a Google search for spiral dynamics, dynamics but look at images because there's these great poster images that explain the whole thing much better than reading a book. And essentially, I could spend an hour and probably should at minimum spend an hour to explain spiral dynamics. So we're going to take a lot of shortcuts here. But essentially, it's a validated model for looking at, there's currently eight primary stages of both individual human development as well as our collective social development as human beings in, in, our, um, in the global society. And you have to move through each stage to get to the next stage. And the only thing that um, will propel you into the next stage is when your life has hit a level of complexity that the model of the current stage you're in uh, can't solve. So you're kind of forced to birth yourself into the next stage. And the stage that most of us are in, by far most of my, I'd say almost all of my clients are in, is the stage orange, which is the fifth stage. And orange is typified by the capitalism and the entrepreneur. Uh, generally speaking, an orange plays a, a win-at-all-cost game or a win-lose game. Um, they, they're seeking personal validation and recognition through success. They need to prove to the world what they're made of. They need to earn love. Love is not something that's implicit or um, unconditional. It's conditional. And so they're constantly stretching to prove themselves. Like Wall Street is it's just like the perfect archetype of, of orange. Now, there's a spectrum of orange. There's early stage orange, which is the more greedy type of Wolf of Wall Street type orange. And then as they evolve, you'll see more like the Zappos, Tony Shea, win-win um, type entrepreneurship orange. Actually, Zappos is probably into the next stage, which is green. And so I'll, I'll use that to dovetail into the next stage, which is, which is green, which is actually the only stage where the color makes sense for the behavior. So green is only interested in win-win games. Green realizes that climate change affects all humans. There is not like, oh, it won't bother me. And green is into human rights, social democracies, direct democracies. They celebrate differences. They're very kind of classic stereotype Bay Area. In fact, a, a lot of the green movement, movement was born here in the 60s. So as I described myself in my startup, in my story, I was operating in, in pure orange where I just needed to validate myself. My ego was attached to the company. I was out to prove myself to the world um, and not for the first time. It's just like it's this cycle never ends. And then most of my clients, I've probably brought about 100 successful entrepreneurs through my program and working with Ayahuasca for the last eight years. Most of them are very successful orange who have felt empty, very much like Tiffany described. It's like, I've got everything I set out to get and I feel lonely and empty. That is like systematically the same story. And that's when they're open to considering something like ayahuasca or, or intentional psychedelics um, or a 10-day Vipassana retreat, these kind of things. So uh, I'm standing there at the gate where orange entrepreneurs are looking for something deeper and more meaningful. And I think the fastest way to describe what a full-blown awakening experience uh, initiated by psychedelics, particularly ayahuasca or 5-MeO-DMT, 
is that it puts you deeply in the, the green or stage six mindset. In the case of 5-MeO, it'll take you further than green. So you get to immerse yourself in an entirely different perspective that might have taken you a decade to realize on your own. And then you wake up and it drops you back where you started in mid-orange usually. And that's where the integration becomes key because otherwise you really can't do much with it. We've all had peak experiences sometimes us for decades before we could actually make a difference, uh, make changes. So what I see consistently with my clients, whether they're hedge fund managers with a billion dollars under asset or VC with a billion dollars of capital they're allocating every year or you know, first time startup founder, is that they move like about 20% jump further through whatever stage they're at, which is usually from mid orange to, to late orange stage or from late orange into green. And then as an executive coach, I'm very accustomed to coaching people through transition. So I focus most of my attention on the, the post experience and making it integratable and actionable um, so that it doesn't just end up a flash in the pan that gets lost to history in your memory. This this integration element is, is a really important part of what I want to further dig into with, with with Tim and Tiffany in terms of what then will business be responsible for in creating those new systems so that when people go through these transformative experiences, they actually have community and culture that supports their well-being in terms of going up into green or what's beyond green, Michael, the integrated stages? Yellow and then turquoise. And, and can you just talk a little bit about yellow and what that represents? I, I can, but I'm afraid it'll get too abstract. And less okay. than 1% of Earth's population is operating in yellow. Okay. So it, it's pretty aspirational. But the quick and dirty on yellow is that your ego doesn't identify with anyone. Like in a, in a company of yellow founders, they wouldn't care who's the CEO. And the CEO role might rotate three times a year, depending on what was most appropriate given the challenges they were facing. So they're very adaptable. Super adaptable and, and positionless, basically. They don't hold a, a strong position. So Tim, let's go a little bit deeper in, into your story. I'd love if you could bring us back to that, that moment of recognition that the way that you were doing things wasn't bringing you the, the contentment or the happiness that you thought it was. And, and what, what catalyzed that shift for you in terms of looking into this green way of perceiving things around us? Um, so the moments I realized that uh, there was not as much alignment freaked me out because, like I mentioned, I had attached my whole identity to the company. And so the company was me. And it didn't help that my friends or people I met like glorified that you know I was a founder and like, that's awesome. Um, so I love to attach myself more to that. And what hit me was that, you know, I would wake up consistently on days where uh, I wasn't like ready to get to work and be like, all right, let's solve this or let's get this going. And if anything, the mindset of going to sleep to get re-energized, to be able to come back up a lot, uh, the next day to tackle the issue again wasn't happening. Uh, if anything, I would maybe numb feelings with weed and marijuana. I might distract myself with YouTube videos or whatnot. I just started to slip down this road. But because I was practicing a lot of meditation, I was able to be like aware like I was doing that. And I was like, okay, something's off and um, let's dive into this more. And as I, as I, I tried meditation to kind of dissect that and yes, it would take more time. Uh, but I was introduced to ayahuasca about a year ago. And so I was like, okay, like I've done some research enough that I feel comfortable and let's see what this is all about. And one key story that I can share around my experience that allowed me to feel into this green stage or be exposed to this green stage was my first one. And my first one, my intention going in was to understand who my best self could be so I could start working towards that. It's a little bit of a type A kind of uh, personality there, but I was like, all right, who's, I, I don't know much about this, but let's see. So I asked the medicine, like, can you show me who my best self is? And I've once I drank, I remember I was like, still type A, like, I got this. Like, I meditate a lot. Like, I don't need a purge. Like, I got this. <laughs> and about 20 minutes after, uh, I start to, like, feel really nauseous and woozy. And then I purge. And long story short, I just, I forget my name and I forget how to breathe. I forget if I'm breathing, actually. 
And I was like, okay, shit. <laughs> control, like, I want to control this. I got this. I, I was taught and I was told by social constructs, like, control it. I got it. Uh, and I remember one of my friends said, come, like, think of a mantra and repeat that during the ceremony in case of any crazy situations that happen. And the two words that came up was love and thanks. And I was like, I'm coming in with this experience with full love. There's no malintention or trying to like, you know, there's a funny onion article of like people going to ayahuasca ceremonies to come up with the next billion dollar idea. I was like, that's not me. That's not me. I'm here to just learn and understand more about myself. So I was like, love and thanks. And I kept repeating that over and over and it transformed into like, start, uh, my best self is one who starts with love and gratitude and all things because I believe that everyone is suffering in some capacity. And it didn't, I mean, it amplified when you hear everyone else purging around you, that they're going through their own pain, through the suffering that they've gone through or the traumatic experiences they've endured. And as I remember that, I was like, I was like okay, my best self is someone who can start with love and gratitude in all things because everyone is suffering in some capacity. And it would be very like, shameful for me to add unnecessary suffering in that. And that, when I realized that, like this pain of like and nause nauseousness of like, did I breathe and who, what's my name? Turn into like just pure laughter and smiling and tears falling off my eyes before I realized I was crying. And I was, I was like, I was like, this is it. That's my best self. And yes, truth is all subjective to the individual in that perspective in these experiences. But I felt so aligned with that that I was like, wow, how can I integrate that? Like after the experience, I was like, I know this is core to my truth, but how would I integrate that? And you can start with little things, right? Like what I did was I changed my email sign off to say with love and gratitude, Tim, right? I changed that, just something very small. But even uh, outside of that, in uh, maybe on the other side of the spectrum, how could I practice that? And in business settings, that's kind of tough when you are going up against like negotiations or uh, you're trying to compete with another competitor that's trying to fight for your lunch. And for me, what I did, and I told myself this rule was, whatever I do, in any situation that happens, just be aware the moments where you can practice love and gratitude. And so that means when I was, I remember negotiating for selling at the company, I felt a lot of frustration when people, when the buyer was like, no, I'm gonna poke you there and jab you there. And I was like frustrated and I was like, you're doing this to me. And I was aware that, okay, I can understand why they're doing that but I chose to accept and practice what I've learned from that truth, which was, okay, in this situation, which is absolutely frustrating for probably many of us, who could be of many of us, how can I practice this appreciation and gratitude for, wow, I am so lucky to be here in this position to sell my company. Like, I am so fucking lucky there. And I'm so appreciative to be in a city where I have this opportunity to do so, right? Just changing that narrative was another like, small, simple practice. But I chose to do that because I believed in the truth that I uh, received. And that's just one of many stories I was able to um, have, but that's just one I wanted to, to share with you. Great, so it's this, this idea of, of reframing, in a way, reframing where, you know, instead of A, things are happening to me, no, I, I've chosen, I've actively chosen to participate this and be active in that process, but also reframing in terms of gratitude, uh, love, acceptance, understanding, these more positive qualities. And I'll, I'll also be first to say, even as someone who, who does have a very purpose-driven work relationship with the third wave and also this retreat thing we're now doing in the Netherlands, Synthesis, I love my work. But there are still days where I am frustrated, I am angry, I am upset, and all of that is to say, although plant medicines can help with these peak experiences, with helping us to reframe, I think what Tim is emphasizing is really important, that it's still a practice. And it's still, in many ways, especially with the culture that we live in, a daily practice to remind ourselves of that. Yeah, the meditation practice on a daily basis is that reminder to keep integrating that into your day-to-day -day life, to be aware that that can be on top of mind for the situations that occur in your business life. But I wanted to reemphasize, it's this awareness that you have the choice to make to integrate these truths that you downloaded from the medicine and making that conscious choice. There may be days and times where, even though I know it's a truth, I'm just so frustrated. I'm like, no, I don't want to trust, I don't want to believe that. And I may make those mistakes and I'll feel that pain of realizing that I'm not following that truth. 
but it's that choice awareness of that that you have that choice to make to integrate that truth that you've downloaded. And so that'll transition really well into a little bit about your story, Tiffany, because as we've hung out the past 24 hours um, and I've heard more about your story, I think one big thing that comes up is, is reputational risk. And, and I think many of us here, in terms of openly talking about psychedelics, like how many of you can openly talk about psychedelics at work, in your profession? And so about half of you, which is outstanding. How many of, you, how many of those people are entrepreneurs? So for people in more traditional settings, we could say there's a significant reputational risk to actually publicly speaking about these substances coming out of the psychedelic closet. And so I'd love to hear you talk about why you made that decision, um, not only from a professional, but also from a personal perspective to openly talk about these substances, to talk about your experiences. Why, why do that? I haven't told my parents yet, by the way. <laughs> Actually, it's really funny. Um, so I'm totally out. It was the call, the, the, the psychic closet. I'm out. The psychedelic so, closet. So I'm totally out. I didn't realize that. So when the third wave event was, I forgot on Facebook that I had some of my employees as friends. And I published it. And I got a text today, this morning, going, holy shit. <laughs> you didn't tell me you were into drugs. Like, you're the fucking coolest boss. OMG, you know? And I was like, oh, fuck. Uh, I was like, dude, it's, it's not drugs, it's plant medicine, okay? <laughs> but fuck, it's out, so It's a classic yeah. response, it's classic. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, my parents still don't know, so this is gonna be interesting. So, yeah, I think for me, it was more about understanding myself. So what ultimately got me to quit was because I couldn't silence this inner voice. You know, we all have that, and it just gets louder and louder and louder. And so it was causing this significant, you know, misalignment and incongruence in me, um, you know, to the point where I was feeling all the emotions of anxiety and fear and all of these negative feelings, and I couldn't figure out why. I knew that, I mean, unlike Tim, who just had ego, I had like ego plus fear, which is like even worse, I think. Um, so I had a lot of work to do. You know, I grew up as an immigrant, and so coming here, you know, when I was 14, like, my mom was always like, you got to make sure when you carry that backpack out today, you know what you're bringing home. So it was like this huge responsibility. So there was always this fear of disappointment, like not wanting to disappoint my parents for all the sacrifices they had made so that, you know, I could be here, you know, to pursue education. And then there was like my ego who absolutely needed the external validation. So I was like bright orange. I don't even know if that's a color. Um, you know, whether it was through, you know, the kudos I got from my boss or whether it's a promotion or a job raise. I mean, I didn't care. You know, I wanted it all. Like my ego needed that because if I didn't have that, I couldn't associate my identity. I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel, you know, that, you know, I had any respect. So my, my, my sense of respect for myself or even any sort of sense worth was tied to this external cultural conditioning, right? Like if I was a manager, then I want to be a senior manager. And then it was director, and then it was VP, then it was GM, you know? And then it wasn't enough that I started my own company and sold it. It was like, okay, what's next? Like there was always this stuff. So I knew I couldn't keep going, like it was just not sustainable. And the more that I, that I listened to those voices and kept pushing myself, the more lonelier I got. And, and so it was really this pursuit to really understand, okay, then if not this, then what? And so when I went through the journey, you know, it was actually quite, I mean, now I can laugh at it, even though it was very profound and spiritually significant. It was like this big joke. What the medicine taught me was that the universe actually is very quite simple. It's us that complicates it. And so what I learned is really about this disillusion of self. So, you know, when we're born into this earth, we're all intact. And as we move through life, whether it's through the indoctrination of, you know, the beliefs of the society, right, going through education and learning that success is about power, wealth, you know, influence and status, you know, and that we're just human, that we can't change anything, we're just a byproduct of nature versus nurture, right? So if we don't like who we are, who do we blame? 
our parents. If we don't like who we've become, we blame the system, our upbringing, education, anything, anything but us. And so ayahuasca was so important for me because what it told me was that I fucked it all up. <laughs> and that while fear had been serving me, it wasn't the right way. Because one of the things I've always wanted in life was flow, right? For things just to flow, like, you know, we're driving down, like, every, like hitting golf and everyone is green. I'm like, yes, like, I wanted that in my life. You know, always green, green, green. And that synchronicity and what the medicine taught me is that flow, simply put, is following love over will. And so, <laughs> you know, like marathon, I was gonna do it. You know, I was like, yeah, ultra marathon, no problem. You know, like whatever it was in life, I was using sure will. And the medicine showed us that divine guidance comes from following our curiosity. It comes from the moment when we're inspired because that's when we're actually in spirit. And so the medicine, what it did was it showed me the green by taking every single moment that I had in my life, that I had those like intuitions, and it stitched this beautiful story. It's almost like all the breadcrumbs that we've had in our life, that moment, that inner, we've all had glimpse of that in our life. We just don't listen to it. We just said, fuck it. And so what the medicine taught me was, again, flow is following love over will, following what you love following what makes you curious, you know, all of that stuff. Intuition, in some ways, following that intuition, following that, that felt awareness. And Tim, that's something I'm hearing with you as well, right? It's this, it's this intuition element. I, I want to ping pong this over to Michael in terms of how you work with leaders then through ayahuasca to develop that intuition, to help leaders get out of their heads to stop just willing things forward and to really feel how they're feeling and to then guide and lead from that felt perspective. And I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that and, and then why you think that's critical in terms of the development of leaders going forward from a business perspective. Well, if I've learned one thing, it's that nobody needs the same medicine. So I personally don't have any agenda for my clients other than what they want for themselves. And they go in with what they want for themselves. And then the medicine reveals something better than that usually, and then help them you know, go get that thing um, that the medicine showed or shift the mindsets or hold the mindsets with the medicine. So it, it is really, you know, I'm, I just released my first podcast and we'll have 10 more coming and the, the first one was a CEO of a YC company that's doing really well. They're on track for an IPO It's called Air Help. And he talks about the impact that ayahuasca had on him on one of my retreats. And he's kind of the classic command and control ex-military guy, so command and control CEO. Um, and that was no longer working for him. He was miserable doing it. The company was really suffering under his, his style of leadership. And so he went to the medicine with the idea of like, what is this anger, this need to control? Um, can I surrender that? And the, the insights he received and the healings and letting go of the chips on his shoulder that he was holding allowed him to do that. So he wasn't looking for a flow state, so to speak. He was just looking for a different way that could work, anything other than what he was doing that was working. And it's very hard to give up what's working for something you don't know will work. But he essentially shift, you know, became a student of delegation and uh, took over HR and, and doubled the HR budget, budget and turned his company into a vehicle for transformation for his 600 plus employees, seeing that if they're all thriving and getting what they need for their personal development at the company and through the company, then obviously the company is going to succeed and he doesn't need to be this kind of dictator CEO. And it's worked great. So this is one of countless examples. Uh, your experience will be as unique as you are. And uh, flow is nice and, and a great one to go for, but I don't, it's not for everybody. What was your second, the second part of your question, Paul? The, specifically with the work that you've done around leadership, what it is that you, co the, the process that you coach leaders through. Yeah, my, my mindset toward leadership is, so I've mostly it's, I'd say I've probably coached about 300 venture-backed startup founders over the last seven years. And 
what I look for is what are their inherent leadership skills? What are their unique qualities that would, if matured, make them into the best possible leader that they could be? And that's different for everybody. And then I look at what are the psychological blocks or PTSD or traumas from childhood that they haven't cleared that are preventing those great inherent qualities from naturally expressing themselves. And then through executive coaching techniques, we'll work on removing those blocks. And if they're willing to work with ayahuasca, then that usually gets those blocks moved out really, really quick. You know, it could take nine months of NLP and executive coaching to do what ayahuasca can do in a week in Peru. And I emphasize that I really am a stand for the, the hero's journey of leaving this country, going to where the medicine comes from and doing it to in as close as a traditional way possible that's still relevant to the western mindset if it's too traditional you, it's like it's a whole different thing it's more of a cultural anthropological experience than a, what you need and then having your transformation there and completing your hero's journey by coming back there's so much to gain by that whole process of journeying and doing the cycle but if a weekend locally is the best you can do that's still a lot better than nothing so to summarize each of you each of us are unique leaders in the ways that we are and if you've taken on running a company then you have no choice but to get on with that really quickly and number one thing that's holding us back from being our fully self-expressed best version of ourselves is this psychological crap that started you know the week after you were born and has been layered on ever since and ayahuasca and other psychedelics will just peel off those layers of cultural and familiar programming and psychological trauma that we all get one way or the other growing up. And uh, with, as those remove, then there's not much to coach. You know, you, they're, they're just present and engaged and alive. And, you, you know, there's leadership techniques, but anyone can learn those. That's what books are for. Yeah, it's an inside out job. Appreciate that, Michael. Uh, not to hijack this, but I was just curious. I, I've noticed that you know all we talked about is ayahuasca, and there's a range of psychedelics, and you working with psilocybin mushrooms at Synthesis for like other execs and, and CEOs. I was curious if you heard of um, other like transformational experiences and how they've integrated from a psilocybin mushroom experience versus just ayahuasca. That's a great question. So. I mean, my personal take on it, and I, I don't have a lot of personal experience with ayahuasca. Most of my personal psychedelic experience is with acid and um, psilocybin mushrooms. And the reason we use psilocybin in, in the Netherlands is because it's legal there. But the stories that we hear of transformation, and there are some execs, but for the most part, a lot of the people who are coming to this retreat center that we're running are in a major point of transition. And that transition might be similar to the stories that we're hearing today. So for example, we had a lawyer who came who was well on her way to making a senior partner at a law firm in DC, was billing almost four figures an hour, had saved millions of dollars, but was miserable, came to Synthesis because she sensed something was not right and almost needed a, a push. Uh, needed needed kind of uh, uh, an ability to, to see beyond that and have the courage to make the next step and then ended up after going through that experience quitting her job and transitioning into what's next for her so we have a lot of people who are unhappy in their jobs who are coming to transition but we have a lot of people as well who are for example retired who have been professionally very successful and they want to do something with the last 20 to 30 years of their life, and they're coming to psilocybin to have that insight about what might be next. And I think the common thing between ayahuasca, psilocybin, LSD, is this sense of ego dissolution. Um, and I'll, I'll frame it within that context, because many of you are familiar with that, probably from Michael Pollan's book, where he talks about the default mode network, um, which usually help, you know, gets us to ruminate on the past and by interrupting that, by dissolving that, we can see things for how they are. And I think that's the commonality between these high dose psychedelic experiences is as you mentioned, Tim, they help us to recognize truth. And truth sometimes is beautiful and astounding and leaves us in awe. And truth sometimes is the shittiest thing ever because it gets us to realize that we were treated a certain way or that we treated other people a certain way, that we, we weren't as loving as we could have been, we weren't as kind as we could have been, we weren't as loving or kind to ourselves, not only to other people, but especially to ourselves. And I think that, to me, is the commonality between 
all of these plant medicines that are being used is that, that, that process of ego dissolution and seeing into, quote unquote, and I'll be careful with how, how I use this, the true nature of reality, um, which is this sense that everything is interconnected, that we are tied to everything around us, and that recognition and that understanding, and Michael, that's kind of what I was also digging in with my question about, is as more and more leaders recognize that from a business perspective, my big question is how does that then change the business landscape? How does that change startup culture? How does that change the way that we decide to invest our money and time and energy transitioning from, okay, returns are what is most, most important, Uber is a really good example of this, win at all costs mentality. Or are we going to decide to proactively start benefit corporations? So B Corps have written into their agreement, articles of association, their stakeholder agreement, the way they're all getting their board of directors on board, that we're not only going to look at financial capital, but we're also going to look at social capital and ecological capital. Patagonia is probably the best example of uh, a B Corp. Etsy is a B Corp, Kickstarter is a B Corp, Ben and Jerry's is a B Corp. There are a number of B Corps. And that's my big question. I don't know if we can answer that here, but how will the growth of psychedelics in places like San Francisco, LA, New York, London, in these creative entrepreneurial circles shift and help us shift away from destructive, extractive corporate culture that is ruining the environment to businesses that are actually reinvesting capital into basically creating a world and a future that we actually want to live in. I have something to say about that. Please do. So now that I get your question a little differently. So having worked pretty much exclusively with entrepreneurs, what I see across the board is they either, they, if they're between companies, the next company they start is a win-win social benefit company, impact company. If they're in a company that isn't, and I had one client that was an arms dealer doing 30 million a year selling assault rifles at gun shows in, in the United States to civilians wasn't feeling very good about it, but it's kind of like golden handcuffs <laughs> in the extreme. And another guy who had uh, was a co-founder of Four Loco, which is one of the fastest growing and largest um, new alcoholic beverage companies targeting 24-year-olds, essentially. So these guys, for example, were like really in the golden handcuff stage, had realized that they didn't want to be doing this anymore, but how do they leave? And through my program, they and with the support of the other guys in the program, they got clear that they, A, we're going to leave at all costs, B, we're going to do it in a good way, and C, weren't sure what they were going to do next, but it was definitely going to be a give back. And within nine months, both of them had left. The one with the arms company started, a, um, actually got behind a nonprofit in Israel, he's Israeli, in Israel that was doing extraordinary things for children that were victims of violence in Israel, conflict violence and uh, kind of became the entrepreneurial leader of this company to, or this nonprofit to make it uh, sustainable and put a lot of his money into it and also started a mini Burning Man for 2,000, maximum 2,000 people in, in Israel, which was, is designed to bring Jews and Muslims and Christians together for arts and collaboration. And that's what he does full time. And the other guy sold his stake in that company and took over as CEO and invested enough to essentially buy a, a plant, a vegan protein drink company. Yeah. So he went from alcoholic beverage to plant protein beverage and uh, running the company like a B Corp. I don't know if it actually is a B Corp, but that's just the attitude. And that was from like both of them haven't done it again. That was one week of ayahuasca three years ago that has led to that income or that impact. And at various scales, it's the same story. They, they move toward from, from me to we, from win-lose to win-win in the best way they can, given the resources and, and experience, um, talent that they have across the board. So the way I see it, the more people who do this, the more we're going to have win-win businesses that are taking on the biggest problems that are facing humanity. Those are always Great stories. And Tim, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what Michael was mentioning, which is for a lot of these people, and I think this is common in the tech space, this is common in the startup space in New York, this is common for many other entrepreneurs that I've talked about, they often start their first project with, 
okay, I'm just going to make a bunch of money. And then once I make a bunch of money, then I can do something that's social impact. Then I can do something yeah. that's, that's yeah. good. And the world can't wait for that. And so I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about Tim. Why do you think that is? Why isn't it that we have more people who are just starting nonprofits or social impact businesses immediately? What have you been exposed to in, in the startup space here? And I just wanted to hear a few of your thoughts on that. So I grew up with a single mother and my sibling, older siblings fought a lot. So I told her, I promised her, I was like, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to make you proud. And I interpret that as um, starting a business and, you know, making money uh, because we grew up in a lower middle class. And, uh, you know, starting my first company, think of it like a blank canvas uh, where you can paint anything you want. But what I painted, what the media painted on this canvas was these you know, you got to win at all costs, you know, so-and-so raised this money, mon much money, and how they did that was winning at all costs, uh, a me versus we perspective. And so I was tainted with that. And unless that narrative changes, that's probably what will continually happen. Now, I will say that if you, as an entrepreneur, are realizing that that's what's probably happening, the canvas is being painted for you and not by you through traumatic experiences or media that you're, you're exposed to, psychedelics could be a very powerful tool to reset that. And what I mean by that is from my personal experiences from psychedelics that m motivated me to step into selling the company because I knew it wasn't right for me to now in the next few companies I start, I know it's going to be service oriented, impact oriented, led and heart led. Like I said, psychedelics provides this reset. And this reset is, is what I've seen is, like what Paul mentioned, this interconnectedness, um, this feeling that these people all around you, you and I here, even in ceremony, like we're all just human beings, all have suffered through our own experiences, and you can feel that compassion for them in that, in that moment. And when I started feeling that, I was like, wow, how sucky would it be if I kept adding unnecessary suffering or, or uh, hurt to, to that in my daily choices? And how horrible would it feel if I, if I made decisions that impacted the environment in certain ways? And I just wasn't aware of that before, right? And so thanks to my partner, like I'm more aware of just like even daily choices I make around plastic consumption or uh, fast fashion and all these other things. But it's until you are real, when you realize, and maybe psychedelics is one tool for accelerating that realization, that w everything you do is connected in some capacity that what you put out can imp impact the person to your left, uh, two times over to your left in some way that you just don't know. Until you see that, you might just be leading with the social constructs that you uh, were taught. And, but psychedelics can be that reset, and that's how that resetted me to realize that that interconnectedness is the main motivation for me to start something next around service, around uh, heart-led, and around impact. So I'm gonna share kind of what I was shown and taught through the medicine, because I grew up with parents who were entrepreneurs turned humanitarians, and so what I learned through them was in order to be spiritual, you have to sacrifice everything, like give it all and live on $20 US a day because that's what they do. And so that sort of scared me, right? Because I have all these attachments, whether it's to material possessions or to my perceptions of what success means or the belief, right? Because again, I had my gremlin, which is the, the need for external validation. I was torn. In my world, I thought it was not possible to pursue spiritual enlightenment while being financially abundant. That these were two mutually exclusive things what the medicine showed me was that that's not true. And that's not true, and, and it showed me what's called a paradoxical cycle of healing and wealth, which is really interesting. And it's actually quite simple. So earlier I said that they taught me that, you know, flow is simply put, following love over will. When we are in the state of love, we have the capacity to be more open to our own pain. When we are able to focus and tune in and heal our own pain, we can then turn into the pain of others. In other words, when we turn into the pain of others, we are healing ourselves. And when we bring more joy to others, we bring more joy to ourselves. And when we bring more joy to ourselves, we're bringing more joy to others. This is the cycle. And so what happens is that the moment when we choose to focus on others and serve others, 
what it does is, like, if you think about it, whether it's loving your children, loving your team, or building this awesome culture, right, so that you can create a legacy for others. So, you know, the moment when we focus on others, we, we find what we start to realize, like, if you start to tune in, you know, that becomes this, like, infinite source of joy, passion, and inspiration. And so very quickly, when you continue to tap into that, you have this reservoir of joy and you have this, this pool of serenity, you know, and this inner peace. And so you start to shift away from this other cycle, which is this pool of attachment that gets us right, really in this cycle where we feel discourse, distress, you know, lack of fulfillment. And so, you know, the interesting about all of this in, in terms of tying it back sort of to the green aspect is it's actually quite simple is that when you follow love, when you love others, you immediately heal yourself. When you, when you serve others, you stay in this constant source of joy, inspiration. And again, inspiration I've been taught is being in spirit. And that is the moment that those divine guidances get shown. Those are the green lights that happen on Goth that like never happens, you know. So it's just interesting because you know it 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 shows that it's actually possible to pursue financial enlightenment for yourself while being financially abundant. What it does require us to do is sort of like decondition and recondition all these beliefs. So one of the things that you know sort of the medicine sort of plotted me was, and I'll, I'll take it was tuning into the pain like tuning into the discourse I was feeling, right? Most of us will just say, let's forget it, suppress it, repress it, escape from it. You know, let, let's not think about it. But really, when we lean in and we push into that pain and that feeling, all the answers is already within, is what the medicine was, you know, so brilliantly wise to show. And, and I think one, one point I wanted to touch on that, that you were making is this, this idea of, of wealth. Um, because right now we've we've been talking a lot about financial wealth and 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 numbers and you know millions and and billions and 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 things like this. And I think one thing to also recognize and conceive of is that the the definition, our very definition of wealth, is changing. And that financial wealth has, for you know, ever since the start of industrialization, been the significant, the primary marker of wealth. And we're now recognizing that concepts like social wealth, which is community connection, friendship, love, relationships, and ecological wealth, which is living in harmony with the earth around us, these, I think, will become increasingly important compared to financial wealth. There's some of those research studies that show, for example, that after about 70K a year for the, the average person, their, their level of happiness really doesn't increase that much afterwards. And so that's also something that I, that I often challenge people on is, is how are we defining wealth? And if we can even change and come up with a more clear measure of what defines social and ecological wealth, because that's very abstract still. It's very abstract. But if we can come up with definitive measures, then I think that is where the, the gift is in terms of helping people feel loved, accepted, nurtured themselves. I can share a little subjective tool for measuring it that I think is super helpful. So if you imagine it's a spectrum, let's say social wealth, like community wealth, people that you feel have your back, that care about you enough to like get up out of bed and go take care of you or show up for you if you, they re if you, really, they, if you really needed them. So however you want to define community, but if you had a spectrum like a bell curve where the, the middle would be perfect, just the right amount of community, not too much community because that's a burden um, and not, not enough community, just right. And so pick the three or four or five things that you want to measure your wealth by. And one of them should be money just so you integrate this all together and plot where you're at on each bell curve with the goal of being in the sweet spot for each one. That's the, like a, a baby easy step for kind of making the tan, untangible tangible um, in a subjective way. Great. A little, a little take-home tip from, from Michael Costuris. One last thing before we move to Q&A, and this is an idea that I've been thinking about, an idea that I would love to see happen, and maybe there are people in this room have, who have been thinking of a similar idea. But what I think would be really cool in terms of helping to 
make B Corps more normative is with the emergence of the cannabis space, which I won't, we won't get too far into, but I think beyond the cannabis space is the psychedelic entrepreneurial space that's going to come up. And we've started a project, like I mentioned, Synthesis in Amsterdam, which is a retreat center there. There are a couple other venture-backed companies as well. Compass Pathways is one. But a, 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 what I'd love to see happen is an impact investment fund for psychedelics that only invests in psychedelic companies that become B Corps. And that incubates psychedelic companies to become B Corps to then have within their mission to contribute back to society in specific ways while still being able to generate profit and revenue to grow and develop the emerging psychedelic space. I think this is the significant opportunity in the cannabis space that is currently being missed out on. From what I know, there aren't a lot of B Corps that are coming up, but I think with the emerging psychedelic entrepreneurial space, there's a tremendous opportunity to make that a normative way of doing business. And I would love if someone somewhere who has a lot of wealth made that, made that happen. <laughs> so that's, that's the note that I want to end on. And um, I also then want to thank our beautiful panelists for all their contributions. If you could give them a big round of applause. We now have time for Q&A. We're going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A. I think Michael clearly is still <clears throat> uh, exploring his, the medicine and sitting on a regular basis. Uh, but it's that question to you two. Uh, it kind of sounded like you sat and then we're done. And I'm wondering if you're still pursuing it. I'm a big fan of ayahuasca uh, and have been for a number of years but I just can't get enough. Uh, I'm wondering why you're just not clamoring for more. Actually, I am. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not done yet. You know, sort of, my intention was really starting off with, you know, someone wise was teaching us that, you know, because I was so eager, right, type A. I was like, all right, I'm ready. What's my calling? You know, what's my life purpose? So what am I supposed to do now that I quit? But I was taught that you have to understand where you came from so my intention was really help me understand you know, what I've become and understand who I am at my core soul level. And so now that I'm there, I sort of like the foundation of knowing my origin, the next phase is really then to go much deeper, right? Really, really understanding who am I to be and what am I to do. So I'm actually going in December. <laughs> Similarly, I'm not done. Um, like her, I'll be heading out in uh, December as well. My only caveat that I kind of set myself for is definitely don't do it because it's cool to do it, but more so know that I have a question or deep intention that I'm trying to explore that I feel um, either blocked or can understand and receive more in these ceremonies or in these ex psychedelic experiences. So trying to be very intentional with continuously exploring it, but not overdoing it to the point where like I'm just not saying that there's any dependence on it, but getting to that anywhere near that point. But to answer your question, I'm still exploring it, continually exploring it, probably a lifelong like explorer, but being very intentional with that. So I still am grounded on this physical earth that I'm here and be able to, if I'm going to talk about it, especially in like group settings like this, that I can set a proper example for that as well. I'm feeling full of hope and inspiration. Um, I think every single person in this room can remember a time, even at my young, young age, when an event like this would not be possible. Tim and Tiffany, I'm really inspired by you both because my story is completely opposite of yours. I was lucky enough to be born in the heart of the psychedelic community. When I was five years old, I was running around Esalen with a group of mm, 20 of the most important people in the psychedelic community. Rick Doblin, Jim Fadiman, blah, 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 Bob Jesse, all the big names. And two things came out of that meeting. The two positions that came out of, we want to do research. And the first bit of research is that we need to use psychedelics with people who are ill, who are terminally ill, and those who have chronic conditions. The second idea, which was a minority idea that was kind of voted down, was that we can do research with healthy volunteers and with healthy people and enrich people's life. My dad organized the conference. Uh, Bob Jesse was there. About 10 years ago, he sent a cold email to some guy named Michael Pollan and said, hey, buddy, I think you should write this book. And Michael was like, eh, 
nah, I'm not going to do that. But I think we're living a dream right now. And there's a lot of work that we have to do in the world right now. And if we can find a way to get these medicines appropriately and safely in people's hands who are creative and have power, then we can work towards the world that we all want to live in and the utopia that we want to live in. That's it. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you for this fantastic opportunity to learn. Uh, I'm here because I benefited from the veteran discount that you offered for the ticket, so I want to thank you for that. I experienced the 5-MeO-DMT this summer because I received a full scholarship, right? Uh, San Francisco is the epicenter of economic inequality. Uh, so you mentioned cannabis. A lot of people can't afford cannabis anymore, right? So in this third wave, in this psychedelic renaissance, how are we going to ensure for inclusivity so that it's not just the top Fortune 500 that have access to it. You know, you know, what are we going to do for scholarships to get you know, folks to Peru or to the Netherlands, right, that can't afford that? Uh, so thank you. I can tell you a little bit about what we've discussed uh, as a team at Synthesis, just to give you some on-the-ground approach. So right now, um, the price point is about $2,000 for, for a three-day retreat, right? So it's, it's pretty expensive. And there's numerous reasons for that, which I won't get into at this point. But because of that, we do have a lot of people who can come, who can offer scholarships. So after they've had a transformative experience, they, they say, okay, now I'd like to offer this to another person or another two people or, another, uh, or, or three people. So I think the first thing that should be done is working with high net worth individuals who, after they go through this experience, want to personally give back by providing scholarships for individuals. I think that is one of the best ways doing it on the individual level. I think on the more systemic or higher up level, this is why I love the idea of a, a B Corp, because as you have more and more, for example, retreat centers or companies that are getting into the psychedelic space and providing this, they can include in their mission statement that as part of rebuilding social capital, that they will offer X amount of scholarships per year to individuals who are suffering from whatever it is they're suffering from, or if they're just low socioeconomic uh, status and they need access to this. I think that's another one. The third thing that I think is something to be really optimistic about is that the major organizations right now who are working on this in the United States are MAPS, uh, which is a nonprofit, uh, and MAPS, the nonprofit, owns a public benefit corporation, which is a B Corp where all the profits from the B Corp go back into the nonprofit to continue to help facilitate research. Now, how that plays out, I don't personally know in terms of providing this, but that's another model to be aware of. And then uh, USONA uh, is also looking at how they can make this medicine, psilocybin. USONA is another nonprofit based in Wisconsin, making this medicine as accessible as possible. So those are the practical things that are happening. And I, I think this is why I wanted in this talk specifically to talk about how when we go from this concept of me to we, then there are gonna be more and more leaders who wanna take care of the we. And I think that will include taking care of people like, like you had mentioned. So I hope that provides a little bit of practical insight into it. Michael, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I'm grateful that you brought this up and I've been in such the like get the basics handled mode for this new retreat that I hadn't thought it through. But just hearing you, I'm clear that I'm going to offer a, a full scholarship to one person and I'll set up a application for the scholarship on the, the page for the retreat at Entrepreneur Awakening. So thanks for reminding me how important that is. I have been around the ayahuasca world to some degree or another for about 20 years. And something that I've noticed, and so I'm asking particularly those of you who have done the, the sitting and facilitating work, one thing that I've noticed is that some people go into it with a very strong personality, and they come out and they've seen a whole new way of looking at life, and things have uh, changed for them, the whole world looks different, they're ready for a B corporation, et cetera. Other people go in with a strong personality and they come out and it seems like they keep going and going and going and yet their personality, their, their ego gets stronger and stronger and stronger rather than kind of seeing a larger perspective. And I was curious from your, from, uh, your experience what you would say about that. Thank you. I'd say some people just have very strong egos. Some people are narcissists. 
And unless their intention is to actually work on that aspect of their imbalance, the medicine isn't going to really fix it necessarily. So there are all kinds of people and in some ways we need them all. To add to that, the, the larger point that I'm, that I'm hearing in your question even is that these obviously aren't miracle tools. These aren't necessarily going to quote unquote guarantee a process of ego dissolution that helps everyone to see how interconnected they are. There are, and we didn't talk about this in this event, but there are definitely downsides to psychedelics as well. Outside of the fact that they're dangerous for people who are predisposed to things like schizophrenia, they also can strengthen uh, the ego. Vice, I think, recently wrote an article about how there's more and more competitive um, psychedelic trippers. And I was joking about this at an event in New York last week where, you know, you start with MDMA, they're like, okay, that was nice. And then you go to psilocybin, and you're like, okay, that was a little deeper. And then you go to ayahuasca, and then you're like, okay, that, yeah, that was something there. And then you go to 5-MeO-DMT. And that's what really, really destroys your ego. So I I think that that mentality will exist for some, but that's also why it's important to create and engage in discussion that creates a new cultural container. So that way, this, this way of perceiving the world becomes more normative because psychedelics also help you to become more adaptable. And so depending on the situation, the context that you're adapting to, that will play a big factor in what happens after the fact. Quick question, Paul, thanks for organizing and for this very important topic. Panelists, thank you. Uh, As many people know, there's a lot of tension in the space right now as venture-backed for-profit arrives here. And without necessarily specifically going into that, I kind of think sometimes about it as this critical conversation that's happening and then this like SUV that's just going to like zoom by and doesn't need to stop and doesn't need to listen. And what should the community do? What dialogue can be engaged in? What maybe self-policing can we do when those interests that don't have the same kind of incentive structure or value structure arrive and play that kind of orange traditional capitalistic role in this space that is trying to be different? Don't buy their products. Michael says don't buy their products. When I was exploring some type of modality of light working. Um, I was advised by this one person who told me something very important that I still stick with today in in respect to what you're asking. It's always kind of like asking, I mean, this perspective, asking definitely like, what is your story and why are you starting something like this? So you you yourself can understand where that intention is coming from. And even within like, let's say plant medicine and, and you speaking with the shamans that they, they work with, like what's their lineage? Like what's their history that they have? And, and, and please educate me on that so I can be most educated and make that conscious decision that I do trust and believe in what you're doing for the purest intention. And I, I buy that and I buy into your service and product. And I'd like to go a little bit deeper into that because that's a great question. And although I wish you hadn't asked it, I'll still, I'll still go ahead and, 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 and at least provide a little bit of my own take on it. So the, 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 the thing that Dave is referring to is there's a venture back company called Compass Pathways that has received $33 million in funding. Uh, they're 25% owned by a company called ATAI, which is a life sciences biotech fund uh, based out of Germany. Uh, Peter Thiel is a major investor in Compass Pathways, or I should say Thiel Capital is a major investor in Compass Pathways. And the guy who runs Teal Capital, Eric Weinstein, is actually a pretty cool, intelligent, smart dude. There are also a couple other financial people who have major things. And Compass Pathways just received FDA breakthrough approval to treat treatment-resistant depression with psilocybin. And they're enrolling 216 people in the United States to go through that process. And it's looking like they could get psilocybin medically approved to treat treatment-resistant depression if all goes according to plan by 2021. So the upside to obviously having a venture-backed for-profit company like that is you can move fast and you can move quick and you can build infrastructure at an unprecedented rate. And that's really important in terms of how are we going to make this medicine more and more available to as many people as possible. And one of the models that they're going off of from what I've understood in talking to them is, for example, in Europe, healthcare is covered by the governments. So there's not a question of this person will receive it and this person won't, because as long as it's provided, it's safe, it's effective, then the government will provide it for their citizens uh, regardless of the cost. So it will be accessible to most people. This is what I understand. I could be wrong on that. It's convoluted in the United States is, is, the, is the most simple way to put that. I'm not sure how that will play out. I think it's really great that we have organizations like MAPS and USONA that are nonprofits that will make that the more normative way, ideally, of providing treatment. And this goes back 
to, I was talking to someone who's very involved in this space. What he mentioned was simple behavioral economics and game theory, is that you create this idea of cooperators and defectors. And so I think that on a very simple level is possibly what could be done um, to help instill some sort of policing of the community is what's more normative and, and supported is something like a B Corp and what's not is venture backed for-profit companies who just want to make a shitload of money. I just want to call something in real quick, which is this question of like, how do we develop an economy that works for people without getting co-opted by large capital? We're not the first community to ask that question. Like the psychedelic space is not the first community. I just want to point directly to a book, uh, Collective Courage by Jessica Gordon Nebhart, which tracks the black community's cooperative economics through time and incredibly radical, strategic, and effective solutions to these questions. I just want to mention that so we can call in the like solidarity that's available to us and the depth of wisdom that's outside of the room right now about how to build, build cooperative economics that goes farther than B Corps. B Corps are like a really great step in the right direction. But last night, I was in a room filled with like 400 people who were all throwing down money to reclaim land and take it off the speculative market. So that's happening too. So I guess a thing I'm like genuinely curious about, like I just feel like it's important for us to hold where, how we're situated in relation to everything else. So I wanna, felt like I was holding, I wanted to offer. And the thing I'm really curious about from y'all's perspective is like as you move in the psychedelic space, What's been, uh, what have been some of like the most effective ways to create relationships across boundaries of race and class and gender? And what are some of the things that have kind of come into the, made it a little harder to do that? And how do you think we can kind of bridge some of these divides that exist inside of our society? I haven't done this uh, specifically, but if you were to get a group of 15 people with different race and gender and background, et cetera, and take them through probably a six week, six week preparation for ayahuasca and then have them go do a journey together, like go to Peru or go to Costa Rica and do a week of this really intensely bonding experience together. What I see across the board is that the people who go through this form of program stay deeply connected for a long time after, at least the ones that choose to. And it's such a leveler. Now the caveat would be that also what tends to come up is all the traumas. So there would really need to be a staff that could handle the personal traumas, the, the interpersonal traumas that come up with all the, the issues that would, would naturally arise and use those as opportunities for bonding and connection rather than disconnection among the members of the group. So it would be a great experiment. It would actually be a great documentary to do that experiment. I can also comment on that. So the one that I just went to back in October was in um, Costa Rica called Rhythmia. You know, in, a, in our cohort of 80, I would say, you know, range from all sorts of different backgrounds, ethnicity, race, gender, um, and definitely age. I mean, we had a couple that was there, I would say, in their early 70s or late 60s. One of the most beautiful thing about, you know, the plant medicine is, you know, as our own layers are being sort of dissolved, right, taking all the way back to our core self, and everyone is too, there's something about the lens to which we see others through their eyes. And one of the most beautiful thing about that is there is no divide at that point the sense of oneness and connectedness. And so, you know, the, the, the concept, I want to say spirit, spirituality becomes really important because at that moment, it's sort of this understanding that we can all celebrate that we're all deeply connected to each other and that connection and the power to that connection is based on love and compassion. So this sort of egocentric world where we have a lot of judgment and prejudice, that does not exist in that world because you see people for who they truly are from a spiritual essence perspective. Yeah, and I'd add that unique to ayahuasca is the, the intense vulnerability that you experience through the pur purging and that it's all happening together in the room. And you, you could engineer that with other psychedelics, but not nearly as successfully, I don't think, as what ayahuasca can provide. And that vulnerability is key to the bonding and trust that's built. 
So I'm loving this room and I'm loving this conversation. I've been spending the last week, I've trained to be an anesthesiologist so I can provide the first legal uh, psychedelics, which is ketamine. And I've been researching and going around this whole week just um, trying to be in dialogue with people at MAPS who have ketamine clinics currently about how can we use psychedelics to actually address race-based trauma. And so I'm talking to the girl in my Uber, in my Uber ride this morning who's like, you know, t has mermaid color hair and so she is in the vibration so so um and i'm just saying do you know any people of color who've, who've done these things and how have this has this helped with race-based trauma and what i'm in these conversations and there is just still such a huge racial disparity and even as we move toward legalization and that these things being medically available there's there's just has historically been a really big disparity in care um, psychiatric care, wellness care for African Americans. And I've been trying, to, I've been making efforts just tr to try to start this dialogue and talk to people who have expertise. And all I can say is that sometimes I talk to them like, I want to know, do you know some people, some brown people who trip so I can talk to them about this question about how does it address race based trauma? And we're not tripping together, people, because they don't know any brown people that they're tripping with. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's such an amazing opportunity because the medication creates wholeness, unity, and wellness. And so if we're going to do the work, we're going to, and I love the idea of how you're sponsor, sponsoring people from low-income backgrounds and also just sponsoring people from racially diverse backgrounds because this is such an opportunity to do such deep individual and social healing. So I'm really excited about the conversation and the mood in the room. I wanted to uh, sort of offer a little bit of hope. I'm part of a network of 70 guides that we come together, and actually about 150 of us have graduated from a training program. And we are specifically trained around 30% of our practice should be on a sliding scale. Um, we just had a retreat up in, and 70 of us were in a retreat up in Ukiah talking about how to increase the diversity of, of both the guides and the client base. Um, so the conversation is very much alive and well. And you don't have to go to Peru. You can just come over to Page Street if you want to go on a journey. And I work on a sliding scale. So it doesn't, you don't have to fly to some interesting place. You know, it, you, can, you can do it here. And there's lots of other guides in, in the Bay Area um, that you can get a hold of. And ketamine is legal. And if you're interested in that, actually, the, the, the first event that we did in New York for the Third Wave Node series, I interviewed a psychiatrist who does ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And that, although we didn't talk about it all tonight, that is a legal, currently legal treatment option. It's just careful, be careful about who you're going to, because some people will just give you ketamine and put you in a dark room and tell you to, to hang out. Yeah, it's the difference between doing it with a psychiatrist and doing it with an anesthesiologist. Like... You want, you want the psychotherapy component yes. to yeah. be there. <laughs> um, I, I want to thank the panelists for sharing and being vulnerable on stage. I think as a person who's pretty new to the community, um, it's really uh, inspirational to hear people using this medicine very responsibly. I, my question is, I'm really attracted to the healing power of the medicine. And um, having some psychedelic experiences myself, I... I just want to go full, full in, like go all out. But uh, the one thing that kind of is holding me back is like, this is, this is very powerful stuff here. And um, just uh, something that I heard, uh, Carl Jung, a famous psychologist, when he was asked about um, psychedelics, he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said, be wary of unearned wisdom. And so, you know, I want to go all in. This is amazing, fascinating stuff. But I was wondering if, you guys could shed a little light about how we can uh, go in more responsibly. What are you afraid of exactly? I guess like I just is it is it okay to just like trip every day? You know, like is it <laughs> like nobody's I'll, gonna I'll nobody's gonna trip every day. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's like um, what should we be considerate of? How can we treat this medicine with respect? Well, when you say this medicine, you're talking about any one of twenty options potentially. Um, LSD, um, but, psilocybin, um, 5 mo uh, You know, I, everyone's going to have an opinion and I'll just throw mine out. I think if, if you do two strong experiences a year um, and properly work with the insights and integration, that, that should, should do it. 
So I'll, I'll take it more from a spiritual perspective because as you said, the medicine is incredibly powerful. And when you're on it, I mean, you're really open. You're opening yourself up you know, as an individual, but also to various other realms. And so to that extent, you're inviting both good and potentially some of the shadows, right? And so, you know, I think it's a good point to kind of check in with yourself to understand to what Tim said is, what is your intention? Is it motivated by greed? Is it motivated by the pleasure of illusion, aesthetics? Or are you truly seeking something? Your mindset going in will be your best compass as to whether or not you are using this medicine with respect. And, and there's a metaphor that I like to use when talking about integration, and that's this metaphor of, of uh, going to the dentist. So every six months you go to the dentist, and this actually aligns with Michael's uh, recommendation. Every six months you go to the dentist, uh, and this is like a peak experience, right? So you get a deep, <laughs> deep... <laughs> Not going to the dentist, the, the psychedelics, right? Every doing, doing it every six months or go, going to something like Burning Man or going and living in the wilderness for a week or, you know, name, name your peak experience. Doing that every six months about. And then every day you brush your teeth, you floss, you take care of yourself. And this is a practice of meditation, of breath work, of spending time in nature, of, of, of checking in, of journaling. So usually when we talk about integration, that's a really good metaphor to keep in mind when talking about peak experiences is just think of the dentist. And the last thing I kind of do for myself to check in is, not to quote Timothy Leary, because I know you said not to, but the whole uh, tune in, turn, turn on, and drop out. I leave the drop out like, alone. I always, I'm tuning in, I'm turning on, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving and being aware of who I am. And, but I always ask myself, what am I learning that could be of service for those around me? Um, so I always try to check in with myself to make sure that I'm not just running away from something or, dro or, or dropping out versus, okay, I'm going in here, I'm curious about X, Y, Z about myself, or I'm curious about what's blocking this, and can I find ways to integrate that for my own healing, but also to be of service for others afterwards. So again, I want to thank you for your attention, for your time for your energy this evening. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being present. And I also want to thank Matt for organizing and putting so much work and energy into this. Please thank him. And also one more round of applause for our panelists who did a fantastic job.